So Jana will speak for about 40 minutes um, kind of general outline of your, of your position and some of the projects that you're doing. I'll do a Q&A with her for about 20 minutes and then we'll have an uh, open session, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Sahel, for such a nice introduction. Uh, we're going to be talking about very cheerful things, as you can see, about life and mainly death and extinction and uh, um, about what's waiting for us all at the end of it and what it means to speak about the end. In their edited book, Making the Geological Now, Elizabeth Ellsworth and Jamie Cruz postulate something called the geological term. So I want to start my presentation to you today by raising a number of questions. What kind of interpolation does the proclamation of this geological term put on artists and writers? Should we not be suspicious of terms that someone else has devised? Why do we have to be concerned with geology? Do we have to be concerned with geology? And how should we contextualize our artistic and intellectual efforts if the context is to be provided by the whole universe? Is this not an impossible or even a crazy undertaking? And I understand the questions I'm posing are related not only to today's session, but also to a number of sessions you're going to be dealing with throughout this course and throughout the kind of number of sessions you'll be taking on your, on your program. Now, a number of thinkers, artists, philosophers have tried to tackle these questions by suggesting, uh, among other things, in making the geological now, that there is an increasingly widespread turn today towards the geologic as a source of explanation, motivation, and inspiration for cultural and artistic in responses to conditions of the present moment. So geology is kind of around at the moment. Uh, when you go to shows, when you read art <coughs> magazines, you will encounter, you might have already encountered the concepts, the visuals around the stuff. You know, fossils are in the earth. We could say that the two authors, uh, Cruz and Ellsworth, are articulating an emerging cultural and artistic sensibility, a geologic turn in contemporary ideas, architecture, design and art, which involves humans thinking in terms of deep time, cosmic time. So thinking about history, not just you know, across 200 years, 300 years, but going back all the way to the Big Bang, or perhaps earlier, if you want to think about multiverses. Now, some contemporary philosophers, artists, uh, are experimenting with concepts that take up the geologic as both a metaphor and a model. You may know that Haus der Kultur der Welt in Berlin recently finished their two-year Anthropocene project. They had loads of artists and theorists involved in kind of weird collaborations. Uh, and they produced this mega volume, which is an art piece in itself, called uh, Grain Vapor Ray, dealing with text textures of the Anthropocene in a kind of textual, visual, material way. It's a three volume plus an appendix kind of uh, exercise in a certain hubris of thinking about the future of the human. It's something definitely worth taking a look at uh, to see how, you know, what's happening at the moment around this concept. Um, so there seems to be definitely um, something happening around this understanding of Earth processes that can offer inspiration of, of how me, we as artists, as theorists, might think about the radical changes brought in by the modern way of life. But what are these changes? Now, the American journalist Elizabeth Colbert uh, um, argues in National Geographic that the most significant change from a geo uh, geological perspective is one that is invisible to us, the change in the composition of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide emissions are colorless, odorless, and in an immediate sense, harmless. But their warming effects could easily push global temperatures to levels that haven't been seen for millions of years. Some species will not survive the warming at all. So we could say that there is something in the air, and this something is a mixture of cosmic dust and human-induced pollution. This something, this something in the air, this sensibility, but also this material change to our conditions of life, to our envelope around us, to ourselves, has recently gained the name the Anthropocene. I'll talk about the concept in a minute. Um, for now, I just wanted to um, think, what does it mean, again, to proclaim the Anthropocene? 
Scientists still haven't decided whether the concept is valid or not valid. They've established something called the Stratigraphy Commission on the Anthropocene, and they're going to tell us later this year whether it exists or doesn't exist. But you can say science, as usual, is a bit late to the party, since, like, artists, as the guys at the end, there are many guys, at the House de Akutu and de Avelde, already finished the Anthropocene project. So, you know, the artists, as usual, are avant la lettre. Um, so, what does it mean, you know, is the Anthropocene already passé, is it already dated, am I already introducing you to the concept that scientists still haven't decided on, but we already discarded and need to move on to another shiny thing, do we have to be concerned with it, how can we respond, should we respond, can we do something creative with this concept. Now, Ellsworth and Kruse, I sent a link to this book, so you might have already looked at it, it's an interesting book in itself, it's this book, Making the Geologic Now, which exists as a, as a platform. One of my many interests, as well as kind of thinking and philosophizing about art and, and other things, is also looking at the book, which becomes um, dismantled and recon reconceived in different ways. So it's a very interesting way of addressing the problem of the disassemblage of the atmosphere and geosphere through the disassemblage and reassemblage of the book. So this is another incarnation of the book as a series of tiles. And they are arguing that new sorts of inventive thinking and making are now possible and called for in response to new material situations of daily life. And indeed, a number of artists, philosophers um, are kind of thinking about these things. Uh, another book I mentioned, which is worth uh, highlighting, is Art in the Anthropocene, edited by Heather Davis and uh, Eugene um, uh, Turpin. Um, it's available from Open Humanities Press, and the PDF is available for free to download, so just Google it. Again, I've sent a link for it. So there are kind of good ways of seeing what can happen about how artists are reconceiving the Anthropocene, exploring ways that seek to recalibrate the human in relation to the geologic. Now, Open Humanities Press has been at the forefront of publishing different artistic and philosophical interventions into the concept. Um, the book I'm going to talk about is my own book, which is also an experiment. It's a very small book. It's much smaller than it looks on the screen. It's a very thin book. It's got really big margins. And I tried, it's called, it's got the adequate title, Minimal Ethics for the Anthropocene. It's also free to download. And I tried to think about you know, ways of doing philosophy as if it was art, and ways of philosophizing as if it, uh, and ways of, of uh, doing art as if it was philosophy. So trying to create an encounter between different modes of thinking and seeing things. Um, and this book is an attempt on my part to respond to this question of the Anthropocene. I'll talk about it in a minute, but I wanted to show you a few other interventions through which I've been dealing with this interpolation towards artists, philosophers, creatives, to take the concept seriously. So one of them was the, the festival Biomediaciones, uh, which uh, I proposed as a concept based on my previous work for when they invited me to take up the post of artistic director of Transitio in Mexico City. And it was a big festival, we had about 25,000 people in attendance, uh, seven venues, um, which was po positing biomediations this notion that, on the one hand, life is mediated, on the other hand, that media themselves are becoming increasingly living. So that dual sense of mediation and liveness of things. And we tried to embrace it both as a philosophical proposition that can be explored best through different forms of performance, visual performance. And we, this is a festival of new media art, but we expanded the term of new media to an extent that uh, a lot of the things included uh, were uh, beyond the conventional understanding of the medium. Although, of course, if you think that everything is a medium, a drawing, language, a piece of wood, then, you know, then that uh, stayed within that definition of the concept. But it wasn't media just in a broadcast media or new media kind of way. It was very new media and very old media. And so that was an experiment for me in trying to think about this relationship between uh, kind of life and other forms um, of, of mediation that it encourages, facilitates. My, um, and my curatorial work is part of this. My 
Art practice is another kind of trajectory for me to try and think through, through this. And I trained as a theorist and philosopher, and uh, about eight years ago, I went to Westminster to do a master's in photography to build on the practice I've always had and kept quiet. And I thought, well, let me just continue with my philosophy. I'll do my practice on the side. And obviously what happened is a complete contamination of both how I write and how I do art. And uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of projects, um, not necessarily maybe visually most uh, attractive, but uh, projects that are responding to the broader set of concerns I'm introducing you to today. So the first piece is called I Earth. Um, I Earth offers a vision of natural spaces that are at the same time man or rather woman made, manufactured by myself from a children's diorama kit. These unnatural landscapes are meant to dazzle with color and lushness, displaying the kind of greenery that is more associated with media representations of nature than with nature itself. With a bird's eye view of these landscapes, I wanted to evoke the perspective of the satellite images of different locations, both remote and familiar, which we associate with Google Earth or Microsoft Visual Earth. This particular perspective has a double function, to denaturalize the familiar and to create an illusion of immediacy, proximity, and visual mastery. Technology is mobilized here on a number of levels, in the crafting of the diorama, in the taking of the images, in the pixelation of the photographs themselves, and then in the last instance, in the, in the GIF animation. Pixelation and animation are not just visual gimmicks for me. They are used as an attempt to destabilize the relationship between nature and artifact, between the real and the virtual. It's also to serve as a reminder of the fact that a photographic representation, be it analog or digital, is always already technological, and that what we think of as landscape or nature comes to us via the physical and technological effort of capturing, carving, molding, and freezing by means of a whole sequence of technological tools such as plows, tractors, excavators, secateurs, easels, paintbrushes, cameras, you name it. Now, so the somewhat serious sounding philosophical agenda is underpinned as well by a more playful desire on my part to poke fun at the monumentalization of nature in the work of meditative large format landscape photographers such as Andreas Gursky or Edward Bertinsky. The now you see it, now you don't aspect, introduce, I'll stop flashing in a minute, that's the last time you're seeing this. Then, but this kind of aspect, things appear, disappear, um, it pushes the viewer to engage with these images physically through squinted eyes. Indeed, the aim is to force you to become actively involved in the process of seeing, to move your head, blink, or even look away from the dizziness of the pseudo-sublime. The homonymy between the I and I in I Earth is not only a commentary on our practice of looking at the world, but also on our own narcissism when engaging with it. The brand-like title is to remind us that this nature has become a commodity, a product we fetishize and yearn for. And just like Vertov's Kino I, I Earth is intended to foreground the technical process of the production of the world through biological and photographic vision. It's also to help us look at nature and at ourselves viewing nature with a different eye. So that's the first project. And the second project, by way of framing the more philosophical argument, is called Topia Dedala. The series of images is this explores various forms of manufactured landscape taken from the two vantage points on both sides of a window. The composite images interweave human and non-human creativity by overlaying the outer world of cloud formation with the inner space of sculptural arrangement. Remediating the tradition of the sublime as embraced by Turner's landscape paintings or Ansel Adams's National Park photographs, the series foregrounds the inherent manufacturedness of what counts as landscape and of the conventions of its visual representation. <coughs> Through this, Topia Dedala performs a micro sublime for the Anthropocene era, 
a period in which the human has become identified as a geological agent. It also raises questions for the role of plastic as both construction material and debris in the age of petrochemical urgency. So this series was developed as a visual track for the philosophical argument in this book, and it's included in that book. Um, and this book um, is about the future, but also about the very possibility of there being a future for humans, non-humans, and last but not least, for life itself. The book arises out of my earlier work on ethics, where ethics for me is more about posing questions about life both in its social and biological aspects, than about telling people how to live. So onto the more philosophical argument on how to do art, philosophy, and everything else in the context of the whole universe, and why this context matters quite a lot. Um, as I said, it, even though the book does relate to my earlier work on ethics, I want to say right from the start that ethics, for me, it's not about morality, it's not about moralism, it's uh, God forbid, it's rather about posing questions about values. And I do ethics only because I'm very scared about other people having very clear ideas about how to live a life. And I'm very scared of values, especially predefined ones that are being passed on through you know, educational system, politics, or lots of other kind of setups. So ethics for me is a form of mobilizing uh, philosophical and artistic reflection to just try and think or open up a cut through some of these values. And so you can see the kind of a Nietzschean hammering at something, seeing what happens. Now, so values around life, let's, let's talk about life and why I'm concerned with, with it at the moment. Arguably life comes to the fore most explicitly when it's under threat. Just think about, do you ever think about life? And what is this life that you think about? Is it the kind of banal meaning of life? Uh, is this kind of life as this, you know, the life and the you know, life and death of famous artists? Humans tend to think about life instead of just continuing to live it when faced with the prospect of death. Be it the death of individuals, so individuals due to illness, accident, or old age the death of whole eth ethnic or national groups and wars and other forms of armed conflict, but also of whole populations, be it human or non-human ones. And it's in the narrative about the impending death of the human population that is about the extinction of the human species that is of particular interest to me in the context of this talk on life and minimal ethics. <coughs> now, in mainstream media, the problem of extinction is usually presented as something inevitable. In the words of the British scientist Stephen Emmett, author of the book 10 Billion, which arose out of a successful stage play in which he took part, and the guy, he's a professor of, of, uh, of some science bit, I'm not sure which one, and also he works for Microsoft. I find this bit of information interesting. And he thinks the word is going to the dogs. Basically, as he says it literally uh, in the opening pages of his book, the current situation can be best described with the following phrase. We are fucked. That's what his uh, diagnosis, scientific diagnosis of the current moment is. So you can have it as byline for the Anthropocene. From. The reason for this supposed state of affairs are as follows. Earth is home to millions of species. Just one dominates is us. Our cleverness, our inventiveness, and our activities have modified almost every part of our planet. In fact, we are having a profound impact on it. Indeed, our cleverness, our inventiveness, and our activities are now the drivers of every global problem we face. And every one of these problems is accelerating as we continue to grow towards a global population of 10 billion. In fact, we can rightly call the situation we are in right now an emergency, an unprecedented planetary <coughs> emergency. Now, this unique situation or rather geohistorical period in which humans have become the biggest threat to life on Earth, has gained the moniker Anthropocene, as mentioned before. And its solution to this problem is quite blunt, given that any technological or economic solutions are not going to work, his advice that he would give to his son would be rather blunt, get a gun. But this is, of course, a powerful story. 
the goal of which is to shock an auras into action. Now, without shooting our gun-wielding messenger, we should uh, point out that there seems to be something narcissistic about jeremiads of these kinds and those that tell them. Well, so we humans have produced narratives about different forms of apocalypse so ever since we developed the ability to tell stories and record them. So there is something new about this story, and yet there is nothing new under the sun about that story at the same time. Um, so my aim with this project on minimal ethics is to tell a different story about the world and our human positioning in it and with it, while taking seriously what science has to tell us about life and death. Because even though the story is age old, there is something around you know, what's happened with the levels of carbon dioxide in our air that is a little different, and it's affecting the health of human and non-human organisms differently. And the same with you know, temperatures or you know, raising of sea levels. So something's happened, and yet the stories haven't changed that much. I'm also mindful of philosopher John Gray's admonition in his Guardian review of Emmett's book that the planet doesn't care about the stories that humans tell themselves. It responds to what humans do and is changing irreversibly as a result. Now, Gray is no doubt correct in his scepticism, yet it should be noted that we humans do care about the stories we tell ourselves. More importantly, stories have a performative nature. They can enact and not just describe things, even if there are, of course, limits to what they, be, they can be capable of enacting. So this book on minimal ethics I recently wrote is one such story about life and death at both macro and micro scales, shaped into a set of philosophical propositions for non-philosophers. <coughs> More specifically, its aim was to outline a viable position on ethics as a way of living a good life when life itself is positioned to be under a unique threat. In other words, it's a story about how we can live a good life at this geohistorical moment that is currently being described as the Anthropocene and about what constitutes its goodness and for whom and whether what is goodness of one species isn't, you know, is actually the hell for, of, for another species. This injunction to outline some kind of teaching of the good life when life is said to be under threat comes to me partly from Theodore Adorno's Minima Moralia, which is, uh, I love this edition, the cover of this edition. It was a 1944 slim volume by the Frankfurt philosopher written as a gift to his friend and collaborator, Max Horkheimer, and subtitled Reflections on a Damaged Life. Now, on one level, Adorno's diagnosis seems to be similar in tenor to Emmett's. And I'm saying we're, we're talking Europe, 1944, and then kind of America looking back at Europe, 1944. Life has changed into a timeless succession of shocks, interspaced with empty, paralyzed intervals. But nothing, perhaps, is more ominous for the future than the fact that, quite literally, these things will soon be past thinking on. For each trauma of the returning combatants, each shock not inwardly absorbed, is a ferment of future destruction. Karl Kraus was right to call his play The Last Days of Mankind. What is being enacted now ought to bear the title after doomsday. Now, the context of Adorno's reflections themselves presented in a series of fragments and what we might call shards of thought. The book's got little aphorisms. It's not really a narrative book. It's a kind of book, you know, written at the moment when language was exploding in the face of the Holocaust, in the face of the trauma, in the face of what was happening to him, to his family, to his people, to his surroundings. So Adorn was trying, trying to think, well, how can we do philosophy, art? How can we think? You know, if thought itself has been pushed to such extremes, as life itself is threatened to such an extent. Um, but he also sees that just after the war, or towards the end of the war, the murder of millions of Jews and others had just been seen as an unpleasant interlude, with modern life reduced to the sphere of the private and merely consumption leading to the alienation and withdrawal of vitality from life itself. Citing the Austrian writer Ferdinand Kuhnberger, Adorno laments that life does not live. But Adorno doesn't just stop because of that. Instead, he goes on looking for life's traces buried in language and for the possibility of continuing with critical thought and writing, 
with the dissemination to teach, with determination to teach about the good life, even if on a very small scale. My own project on the minimal ethics draws inspiration from Adorno's persistence in minima moralia to keep philosophizing as against all odds, to look for signs of life in the middle of an apocalypse. Even if my own context and the existential threats that shape it are very different, of course, from his. The ambition and orientation of my ethical propositions also differs from Adorno's. Even though I embrace the critical spirit of his work, I turn to various philosophies of life, as well as kind of feminist thinkers and artists, in order to outline a more affirmative framework for the times when life is said to find itself under a threat on a planetary scale. So my aim here is for us to consider to what extent we can make life go on, and also how we ourselves can continue to live it well, while interrogating what it means to live life well, and whether such a consensus can actually be reached, or whether it's always going to be an, a, a, a dissensus, a conflict between different mutually incompatible ways of life, like my way of life and the life of an ocean, my way of life and the life of a cow or a salmon you know, I might eat. So. It needs to be said, and I haven't got answers to most of these questions, so it's not really a plea for like, vegetarians or against. I'm just good at raising questions, mainly. Anyway, it needs to be said that this we of my argument is already posited as a problem, referring as it does to what philosophy and common sense have designated as humans but also opening onto a complex and dynamic network of relations in which we humans are produced as humans and in which we remain entangled with non-human entities. The direct inspiration for my projects comes from a wedding of eco-sex artists, Beth Stevens and Annie Sprinkle, who married Lake Calavesi. This is Lake Calavesi and they're married now, although the ceremony was quite big. This wedding took part, um, you know, the, uh, so Lake in Finland, in Northern Savonia, and it took part in the Anti-Contemporary Art Festival in Kuopio uh, in September 2012. And I wrote a short piece um, on non-human, uh, on minimal ethics as a wedding gift for them. Now, this human-non-human -human wedding between more than two parties was in Stevens and Sprinkles first. In previous ceremonies, they had married the earth, the sea, the, sea, the snow, and the rocks thus playfully taking on and enacting what Donna Haraway calls the nature-cultural kinship, but one in which love is not enough. Stevens and Sprinkle's performance serves here as an entry point into a different mode of philosophizing, one that borrows from artistic sensibilities and that produces ideas with things and events, rather than just with words. This mode of philosophical production is necessarily fragmented it gives up on any desire to forge systems, ontologies, or worlds, and makes itself content with minor, even if abundant, interventions into material and conceptual unfoldings. And the minimal ethics I'm trying to outline is one such possible uh, intervention. This mode of working I'm employing here mobilizes what could be termed a post-masculinist rationality, a more speculative, less directional mode of thinking and writing. The notion develops from the Canadian thinker Darren Barney's concept of post-masculinist courage. For Barney, courage that is post-masculinist is not necessarily therefore feminine, or even really post-masculine, though it's very likely to be feminist. Barney's call is in turn inspired by political theorist Wendy Brown, who has outlined a vision for a post-masculinist politics in which freedom is like reconciled with love and recognition. Such politics requires much courage and willingness to risk. Barney suggests this sort of courage needs to be distinguished from the sort of bravado <coughs> whereby men seek to ex exert control over everything around them by the force of instrumental rationality. Post-masculinist courage involves for Barney the courage to face the uncertainty of that which we can't control, the courage to be let go into action that begins something truly new and unpredictable. A post-masculinist rationality is by no means non- or anti-rationalist. It just calls for a different modulation of rationality, 
one that remains more attuned to its own modes of production, is very close to artistic sensibility. So no matter what your political position into, and again, um, as I wasn't agitating for uh, vegetarianism a minute ago, neither am I now agitating for feminism, although I could if you wanted me to. But that's the, the point I'm making now is just to suggest a different mode of working that is no matter of your gender or polit political affiliations, is much more in sympathy with an artistic mode of thinking which kind of goes, go, goes into things, takes risks, and doesn't take too many things for granted, is prepared to chip away at concepts, seeing what happens, without having a kind of big thing, and one that doesn't build ontologies. There is a very worrying trend for me, as a philosopher at the moment, around uh, ontology building, which is another way, it's like philosophers playing with Lego sets and playing with, with themselves mainly. And so the Lego sets are words and concepts, and they build worlds, and they pass them on as gifts to others and make others believe that these worlds are true. The only problem with this is that they forget about this playful, foundational, artistic moment when they tell you that this is just a game, that they are playing. So the playfulness that is lacking from the current ontological drive of contemporary <coughs> philosophy is something I find very worrying. So but again, you're artist, I don't need to tell you. Just be wary, if somebody offers you a world, or a picture of the world, or a maquette of the world, just, you know, show them that picture. And it can be a woman, it doesn't have to be a man, I mean, women do that as well, so. Anyway, so the brief reflections of it today are linked to my previous work on what it means to live a good life at a time when the very notion of life is undergoing a radical reformulation both on a philosophical and biotechnological level. But I'm less concerned with a critical discussion of different theoretical positions on ethics, and more with sketching out this kind of affirmative proposal for an ethics that makes sense, and that senses its own making. The idea of this core of matter expands on my argument from my book Bioethics in the Age of New Media, in which I positioned bioethics as an originary philosophy situated even before ontology. So the idea, it's gonna be a few minutes of kind of hardcore, hardcore philosophy, but you know, bear with me. The idea was inspired by the work of the Lithuanian philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, although I remain troubled by the humanist limitations of Levinas' ethics, where a primordial first responsibility exerted upon me as a human comes from human others. But for in bioethics as an ethics of life, which is what I offered there, um, the human self has to re respond to an expanded set of obligations that affect her, make an impression on her, allow for her differentiation from the world, and demand a response that is not just a reaction. So while I do recognize, together with other theorists of post-anthropocentric thought, that it's not all about us, I also acknowledge the singular human responsibility which is exercised both by philosophical theory, which very few people do again professionally, and philosophical practice, which a lot of people do, though not always consciously. So this recognition hopefully justifies to some extent the reluctant yet also sometimes inevitable use of the pronoun I in my talk, in my writing, and the multiple paradoxes implied <laughs> in any attempt on the part of a singular female human writer to author a post-anthropocentric ethics. This post-anthropocentric eth ethics, after anthropos, after the human, so this of expanded obligations becomes a way of taking responsibility by the human for various sorts of thickenings of the universe across different scales and of responding to the tangled mesh of everyday connections and relations. Now, if my mode of thinking embraces a post-masculine's rationality, its method can be loosely described as critical vitalism. This method involves rethinking and remaking life and what we can do with it. Taking life as a yet non-valorized minimal condition, critical vitalism remains attuned to stoppages in life, seeing life as both a becoming and a fracturing process. Claire Colbrook articulates this dual, productive, destructive tendency of life in the following terms. Philosophy can't simply decide to begin from ground zero, nor can the living being become so open and receptive to its milieu that it wouldn't inflect, pervert, or fold its passions around its own life, 
Imminence is an ongoing struggle. So critical vitalism entails knowing the difference of difference. It considers how differences ensure and ensue and matter, who they matter to, and how matter itself resists, recoils. Now, what does it mean, once again, for this ethical framework I'm outlining here to be pointed towards you know, the Anthropocene? The term itself, the Anthropocene, was proposed by the Dutch chemist Paul Crutzen, actually won a Nobel Prize. Anyway, in 2000, in, the term was proposed in the year 2000. The name comes from Anthropos, man, and scene, new. And it serves as a name for this new geological epoch. Now, scientists still can't decide when this epoch started. Some point to the Industrial Age, so, you know, kind of mid 19th century with big chimneys in Europe and the transformation. <coughs> Others point to, uh, you know, early days of agriculture. Others point to the last uh, ice age, end of the last ice age. So you can see that historically it's a little imprecise. Was it like 12,000 years ago or was it 150 that it started? And yet others still don't know when it started or not. But the interesting thing, again, in this discussion, especially if you are, your interests are more creative, is in articulating this different sensibility, this geological, geographic, material sensibility around something that is in the air, and recognizing uh, situations in which or effects of the human as a geological agent. Of course, the human has always emerged, co-emerged with the so-called world around him or her. But at the same time, the Anthropocene names the period in which the human has made and you know, irreversible changes, changes that can't be taken back in a way. It's like the passenger pigeon can't be uh, uh, de-extincted, although there is a serious going of, from Silicon Valley, of course, de-extinction program now. Try. It's a bit like Jurassic Park, but like a bit more serious. They are trying to bring back usually cute species, you know. So uh, again, politically, lots of questions to be asked. So there is, again, the need for this new term was justified by human kind of influence. Um, and Elizabeth Colbert's article in the National Geographic that I quoted from earlier, that was the article, it was in 2011, that really brought the term to the kind of general, uh, you know, general population, if you like, at least in the um, English-speaking world. Um, and obviously I'm kind of showing you a certain set of images that are uh, associated with the Anthropocene and the kind of geological locations of this. But my own use of the terms, again, I'm not a scientist and neither am I interested in determining scientific truths. My own interest is in the terms rather as an ethical pointer more than as a scientific descriptor. What I mean by this ethical pointer that the concept becomes an obligation. An obligation for me not necessarily to be a better person, since I wouldn't quite know what this actually means, but it would be an obligation to respond to the task that this set of events and changes that go under the name of the Anthropocene poses upon me, not just as a philosopher, writer, artist, curator, but also as a living, breathing organism that has to live through the consequences of the Anthropocene and is also herself the cause of the Anthropocene. You know, through buying plastic bags. Now Britain introduced the 5p charge for plastic bags, so there might be you know, fewer. There's an interesting art project about the guy who found all the dead birds and photographed the insides of their stomachs, and most birds had uh, plastic bags in them. It's a bit disgusting and a bit beautiful at the same time. So there is that kind of obligation that um, the Anthropocene uh, poses. So even though the Anthropocene is about the age of man, the ethical thinking it designates is strongly post-anthropocentric. Again, it's like thinking, trying, the human trying to think from the point of view of after the human. Or the artist trying to make art from the point of view of after the human. It might sound crazy, it might seem impossible, but just try and do it. What would you do, you know, how could a stone make art? Could you imagine yourself as a stone making art? Is it making your head wobble? And so that's kind of a... And thinking yourself from your humanity while also realizing the hubris of this very gesture, because you can't. 
you can't really abandon your own formation, your own kind of corporeal embedding. I mean, obviously, some forms of uh, hallucination, drugs, and whatever can occasionally take you there. Psychosis can be there longer, but longer term are strategies for, they are probably not recommended. So in a way, you return to a certain moment of recomposure. But what would it mean for a human, for an artist, to have this excursion into the post-human moment? Something that isn't just a narcissistic exercise, and like, oh yes, let's try and you know, think ourselves out of our standpoint. Again, humans have tried it across centuries, but there are some serious political, ecological uh, needs for that desire. You know? So like, what is it like for, for a dolphin, for example? What is it like for the atmosphere? You know, what is it not just like for me? And then can I bring it back to my own modes of theorizing, creating, thinking? Um, so mineral ethics is not just an updated form of environmental ethics. It doesn't pivot around any coherent notion of an environment as an identifiable entity, but rather concerns itself with dynamic relations between entities across various scales, such as stem cells, flowers, dogs, humans, rivers, electricity pylons, computer networks, and planets, to name but a few. So it's kind of whizzing up and down scales and then returning, returning to a certain anchor point. The returning moment is important in all of this, because there, there can be great pleasures in whizzing up and down and pretending we can see the world from any viewpoint. But you know, then we forget about the anchoring of our own standpoint from which we develop theories for art. So there's a small chapter on scale, on the idea of scale, on what it means to think big or small in the minimal ethics book. So the closest way of describing this kind of minimal ethics would be as an ethics of life, again with life understood philosophically and biologically. Its starting premise is that we humans are making a difference to the arrangements of what we are calling the world. Naturally, we are not the only or even the most important actors that are making such a difference, like a meteorite that made you know, a difference in Yucatan uh, several billion years ago and probably killed the dinosaurs, made more of an impact probably than we humans have in our existence. But it would have been extremely naive and short-sighted to take the Anthropocene as another story of our own human hubris, like, oh, aren't we amazing? We've done this, we've done that, and now we are also making a real mess of the world. Look at another. And some of the Anthropocene stories have precisely been taken in this spirit as another story yet in the human greatness, but now focusing on the greatness of the negative effects we are having. It's about introducing a certain humility, if you like, to a certain perspective from which you can actually try and say something. Thanks to our human ability to tell stories and to philosophize, we can not only grasp the deep historical stratification of values through an involvement in what Deleuze and Guattari called a geology of morals, we can also work out possibilities for making better differences across various scales. So while our participation in the differentiation of matter is ongoing, frequently collective or distributed, ethics names a situation when those processes of differentiation are accounted for, when they occur with a cognitive, affective effort to rearrange the solidified moral strata with a view to producing a better geomoral landscape. Now, so this ethics discussed here is minimal in the sense it's non-systemic. It doesn't depend, so it's not rooted in a larger conceptual system. It's non-normative. Um, for some people, this kind of non-normative ethics may be a conceptual blind alley. For me, who is wary of any capital V values, uh, there is nevertheless a desire to embark on this project with one minimal assumption, a conviction that we have a responsibility to engage with life, materially and conceptually. Because as we know from Socrates, the other unexamined life is not worth living. What counts as the examination of life, for me, goes beyond this Socratic method of inquiry, instantiated between two parties with a view of kind of getting rid of errors. For me, um, this examination of life also involves physical engagement with the matter of life, with its particles and unfoldings. So minimal ethics for the Anthropocene is to be a caution 
against understanding the Anthropocene and all the kind of ecological problems too well and too quickly, as well as knowing too precisely about how to solve the problems it poses. So it's kind of seeing it as an injunction, but also re retains an injunction to become critical towards the very notion of the Anthropocene. Um, the conclusion that emerges is that critical thinking is perhaps one of the forms that politics of the Anthropocene can take. And perhaps thinking is indeed the most political thing that we can do with regard to the Anthropocene before we go and do anything else. This shouldn't be the result, uh, mistaken for a sign of resignation or quietism in the face of a planetary task. As Dave Boothroyd <coughs> observes, thinking is doing something even if from the outside it looks like doing nothing. So the recognition of the non-necessity of the universe and of the emergence of life, including conscious life in it, doesn't diminish our human responsibility for this medium-sized planet we call home and its surroundings, or for its human and non-human inhabitants. But it does potentially strip any mode of philosophizing, thinking, creating things in it of a certain explanatory hubris. This kind of post-anthropocentric, post-humanist standpoint poses a challenge to human exceptionalism, but also remains accountable for the role we play in the differential constitution and differential positioning of the human among other creatures, both living and non-living, as Karen Barrett puts it. So even though it's not all about us, we humans have a singular responsibility to give an account of the differentiation of matter of which we are part. And art could be seen as one of the ways of offering such an account of the differentiation of matter. You do it with different media, you don't have to do it with words. All the words, of course, are on a spectrum of the different media artists could use. Uh, ethics is therefore linked with poetics because it comes to us through images and stories through narratives of different genre and kinds. The poetic role of art, with a Greek term poiesis, stands for bringing forth or creation, should be recognized here as fundamentally world-making rather than merely aesthetic or ornamental. So the minimalism of the, of the ethics project doesn't therefore refer just to the premises of its main argument. Aimed as an exercise in brevity, this kind of ethics adopts a formal structure that comprises 21 theses, and the aim is to say just enough. So it kind of draws on uh, you know, philosophy or, of, of people like Heidegger or Derrida or feminist thinkers such as Louis Irigaray, but I would like to encourage you, and I'm kind of wrapping up now, I'd like to read you these 21 theses. Uh, they are not commandments, they're like anti-commandments, if you like, so don't think of uh, anti-commandments, although it's telling someone, don't think of commandments, a bit like telling someone, don't think of the white elephant, and then the main idea you put in someone's head is this concept. However, the 21 theses I'm going to present, they are like aphorisms that the book ends with, and they might go somewhere, they might not go anywhere. And I haven't got a written version for you on purpose, because I'd like to, you to listen to them, imagining as if you were listening to poetry. And in a way, almost no philosophical preparation is, well, is, is needed. In fact, no philosophical preparation is welcome. And I think you can listen to them with a better ear this way. The universe is constantly unfolding, but it also temporarily stabilizes into entities. None of the entities are pre-planned or necessary. Humans are one class of such entities, which is as accidental and transitory as any other class. The differentiation between process and entity is a heuristic, but it allows us to develop a discourse about the world and about ourselves in that world. The world is an imaginary name we humans give to the multitude of unfoldings of matter. Transitory stabilizations of matter do matter to us humans, but they do not all matter in the same way. Ethics is a historically contingent human mode of becoming in the world and of becoming different from the world. Ethics is therefore stronger than ontology. It entails becoming something in response to there being something else 
even though this something else is only a temporary stabilisation. This response is not just discursive, but also affective and corporeal. Ethics is necessary because it is inevitable. We humans must respond to there being other processes and other entities in the world. Our response is a way of taking responsibility for the multiplicity of the world, for our relations to and with it. Such responsibility can always be denied or withdrawn, but a response will have already taken place nonetheless. Responsibility is not just a passive reaction to pre-existing reality. It involves actively making cuts to the ongoing unfolding of matter in order to stabilise it. Material incisions undertaken by humans can be ethical decisions, even if the majority of such cuts <coughs> into matter are nothing of the kind. Even if ethics is inevitable, ethical events are rare. Ethics requires an account of itself. <coughs> ethics precedes politics, but also makes a demand of the political as the historically specific order of a times collaborative and a times competitive relations between human and non-human entities. As a practice of material and conceptual differentiation, ethics entails violence, but should also work towards minimizing violence. There is therefore value in ethics, even if ethics itself needs no prior values. Ethics is a critical mobilization of the creative principle of life in order to facilitate a good life. Ethics enables the production of better modes of becoming, whose goodness is worked out by humans in the political realm, in relation with and with regard to non-human entities and entanglements. There's more here. Thank you. That was a, uh, there's, there's a lot in that. So my questions will be... Uh, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So my questions are going to be um, more expository. I'll try not to err into mansplanation as I, as I ask you. Uh, I've got basically three questions um, which, which you could use to kind of cover a lot. I mean, it was a very fast and comprehensive presentation of your concerns. Um, and the first question is about human exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. So towards the end, you said that um, that the challenge of the Anthropocene is for us to um, get rid of human exceptionalism as a condition for ethics and for thought and for responsibility to the planet. Mm -hmm. And human exceptionalism would be would be the model in which we imagine it's like we're, I mean, theologically we'd be God-given creatures, mm -hmm. we'd be the center of the universe, the whole universe will revolve around us. We have gotten rid of that image. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Richard Dawkins still has the idea of human exceptionalism in some sense, even though uh, he has a non-religious version of it, but still we've arrived at something quite particular and quite special. Right. There's something unique about us. But for me, that idea of this human exceptionalism, it would be, there is something I would call human singularity, which means that in a given moment of time, which is kind of now, or if you think about cosmic, cosmic scales, the human existence on Earth as a kind of a storytelling, philosophy and art making entities is relatively short. And that to me matters. But also it matters to me that we disabuse ourselves of the special notion of that we were created or made for something. And obviously it's a non-theological position, or a non-religious position. It's not grounded in any kind of belief that humans are going somewhere. It does speak to a certain scientific interpretations of evolution, but which is not teleological, which means it's not assuming that we are on a trajectory from A to Z, nobody quite knowing what Z was, but that we are progressing, developing, getting better at something, some purpose. There is a certain accidentality to the way I see the human. At the same time, once I've whizzed out and look at the human from you know, however many light years ahead, I then return to the human. And think, well, there's still something interesting happening to this kind of funny species that's, you know, in a way so fragile. We are much more fragile than dinosaurs, for example, or <laughs> elephants, when you think about it in lots of ways. And we can do certain things better than elephants. And, uh, but it's kind of interesting. A lot of scientific work has shown that the barrier species 
has been breached in almost every case. So there is nothing that we could say that really the human is so We do certain things better, and do certain things like flying, for example. We don't do it as well unless we're on planes, but then it's not really us. Even pilots don't fly anymore, but they are planes. So we're not good at flying, but we are quite good at logical thinking, although some people are better at it than others. We are quite good at painting, although some you know, chimps are quite good at that too. So in a way, language, you can see dolphins communicate, and so, so any, and I'm not kidding you, there is a lot of anthropological research around um, the kind of human traits showing that they do function across the species. But there is something historical, so rather than biological or natural, although nature and history are just, you know, it's a question of temporality, or maybe the same thing really. So when you return to the human and think historically specific practice of art making, or storytelling, or philosophizing, I find these practices quite interesting, and only because I've, I've debunked the notion of the human as exceptional, doesn't mean that suddenly I don't value, don't find interesting. I find it particularly interesting now, from this different reworked position, of thinking, well, what can it tell us about this historical uniqueness of these practices that we've constructed for ourselves? And how can we dismantle the uniqueness of these practices and yet also recognize that, you know, there is value in art history, for example. So you think, okay, this species has done this and that and the other through centuries. Isn't that amazing? That's, I'll have so, to so, cut you across, sorry. No, it's fine. Um, it saves me mansplaining, so it's good. Um, I have two, two, two questions to, to take that out. One, um, you, can make, you can make the point, uh, the same point, um, without the Anthropocene. Right? And so um, I hear some allergy on your part to the object-oriented ontology mm -hmm. approach, which would be the claim that... Except it's the absolute opposite. Okay. Yes. Um, so I, I gathered. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. But, but, yes, but yes, so if you don't know, the object-oriented approach would be um, the, the kind of privileging of the human as the center for apprehending the world mm -hmm. needs to be done away with, and we need an mm -hmm. equality of things mm -hmm. on the basis of another type of relationship, mm -hmm. which is not about mm -hmm. rational yeah. thought, right? Except that the so, whole notion of the object in itself reinstates that. I mean, I could have a rant about object, I, but maybe I'm I I'm going to invite you to in a minute. <laughs> but let me yeah. let me just ask this. Yeah. But you, so so you can make you can make the um, you can make the case against human centeredness or mm -hmm. human exceptionalism just on theoretical grounds, mm -hmm. or like a like a modesty of humans because we should be more. Franciscan or something like this, mm -hmm. right? um, like Saint Francis type figure, but 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 you're <laughs> but you're putting it in the context of the Anthropocene. So I'm wondering why mm -hmm. the kind of material uh, material conditions of the Anthropocene um, sort of impose impose mm -hmm. the thoughts upon you, mm -hmm. rather than just like a, sure. a theoretical. Because I think the Anthropocene becomes for me a thought device, but also it becomes a useful a useful uh, thought device for a particular moment because of its kind of material and uh, historical connotations. As it, it, names, it names a certain uh, set of circumstances. It says, well, something's changed, you know. It's like you can't eat cod anymore, although apparently you can't eat cod now. Something else you can't eat. But there is less and less of it in the sea, for example. Or, you know, it said in the papers on, on the Sunday that we are not going to reach uh, our agreed consensus of two degree uh, global warming. We're going to exceed this. And if we do, things are not going to look great for us, our you know, future children, or whatever we, we're going to generate. So these kinds of things, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm slightly interested. And I'm not even interested, I don't have a messiah complex. I don't want to save humanity. If all species are transient, in the sense, of course, I know humanity will pass. But I'm also interested, intrigued by the same way that to remain sane, you have to forget that you're going to die. And Heidegger developed this argument. So you kind of all know you're going to die, but unless you're clinically depressed, presumably you don't always, every living moment, <coughs> consider the fact you're going to die. You kind of have to push away this thought, even though it's somewhere in the back of your mind, but it has to recede to they survive. Were, they were doing quite well with that until you remember. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm kind of, that, that will recede as well. Uh, that will, you know, stay with you for half an hour, and then just you'll do other nicer things, go to a, a gig or an exhibition, and see some colours, and it's good, and it's kind of something biological in us that we've got this inability. But also, I'm wondering about us as a species that we are also unable 
to uh, think the Anthropocene seriously. So we think about it, we are telling ourselves with a species, you know, the oceans can go up, and, and yet we can still return to ways of living as, um, as if, you know, we hadn't been told this. Now, I'm not an eco-activist. I don't even, I'm much more interested in these forms of, of species denial that we're exercising and thinking, well, what would it mean if we were to think across it, do something with it, other ways of uh, introducing it into our lives, uh, rather than just this kind of big trauma that hangs over us, can we actually do something? So in the sense that, you know, we might like not constantly consider death, but we also do things that, you know, we try to prevent it, as in, you know, sometimes some people take vitamins, other people go to the gym, other people do this, and uh, even, you know, education is also a form of bettering yourself. I mean, you're all doing an MFA, it's partly because obviously you all will be famous, but partly it's because it's a form of bettering. I mean, you could just sit, sit in your studio and tinker away in whatever you're doing, but you've still decided to enroll a kind of quite, you know, formal institution to better yourself as a human, to have this. So that kind of uh, moment of, of, of a gesture of investing in something is of interest to me. What do we do? How do we do with that? And answer, it, this argument could have been developed, and obviously was developed. You can think about, you know, Eduardo Cadaver's book, who comes up with the subject, and all these earlier critiques, and obviously my kind of philosophical training still comes very much out of it the continental philosophy, but something's happened around this notion of the Anthropocene that became of interest to me, that touched me. And in some sense, you know, as academics and artists, you also respond to fashions. So there was something in the air, literally, but also conceptually, that I thought, yeah, there's something in it. Let me just go and poke at it and see. So yeah, it, I also kind of responded to a certain fashion, and I realized maybe it's more than a fashion. Maybe there is something to it that's worth exploring. Okay, so the, the question I wanted to ask you following up from that was, it's kind of twofold. One, um, whether, because, because in some ways the Anthropocene is a non-theoretical non issue, right? it's a material issue, it's, uh, it's planetary, uh, and in your terms you extend it out to universal. So mm -hmm. it's like a non-human mm -hmm. imposition upon human thought and responsibilities. Um, whether, whether the materiality of the Anthropocene is related for you in the turn to, to photography and visual mm -hmm. as a way of thinking this, of, of approaching this rather than just mm -hmm. theoretical mm -hmm. articulations. And secondly, um, if, if the argument is against human exceptionalism, and that's the condition that we have to enter, um, one, I'd invite your rant against object-oriented ontologies, mm -hmm. uh, which also say, like, let's get rid of the human. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, what's, why, why do you insist on ethics? Because mm -hmm. historically, ethics is like, it's another form of human exceptionalism, right? Mm -hmm. So humans are ethically responsible for themselves mm -hmm. and for the planet, sure, sure, so sure. in a way that no other species mm -hmm. is. Yeah. So um, the kind of return to, I mean, ethics as a way, um, I mean, I borrowed this notion of ethics from this guy Levinas I mentioned, where ethics becomes almost a second level reflection on morals, and also becomes a form of responsibility. Now, some people see it as bad faith, like, you know, or you can call it kind of lapsed Catholicism, or lapsed Judaism. I mean, he, he was a, also a Jewish theologian, but it wasn't lapsed. He, although he very clearly uh, distinguished between his religious writings, and that's what he did. My theories are definitely non-religious, any, they're non-religious in any denomination but they do respond to a certain material recognition that when a human, you arrive to the world as a human, and obviously you have very little awareness of that, but you can only ever respond to stuff. You know, you're never the first human in the world. So although sometimes children think they are, and it's a big shock for them when they discover that there are others. But you know, you can only respond to the touch, and it could be a caring touch of your mother and father, could be a violent touch, depending on what family you were brought up in, what circumstances. But you only ever develop your bodily sense through, you know, through others who are shaping you in some way, through language that's given to you as a gift. And a gift you might want or not want, you might enjoy speaking, let enjoy it less. But it's just the whole you, the shaping of yourself as a human, it only already comes from that moment of touch. And this is what Levinas calls a responsibility that you are being called to respond. And it's like mixing in French, though, fortunately in English it's a similar thing, response and responsibility. You're called in. The difficulty is you're called in, but you don't know what to do. You're kind of called in to do what? And not to be necessarily a St. Francis, and uh, I always have a horror of St. 
like monastic, okay. monastic <laughs> figures. And, uh, uh, but it's like, maybe it's a way of figuring out, maybe having you know, an artistic life as well is a way of figuring, out, fig figuring it out, being touched by something, having this itch, having this certain set of impressions and positions. And, and doing, we just, but obviously it's not just artists who have this, uh, trying to translate it into terms of this particular class. Anyone has to respond. Doesn't mean that everyone always lives their life in this kind of deep level reflection, but there is a certain push to respond. Most of these responses won't be ethical. So for me, ethics would have to do with this recognition of what I call historical singularity of the human. In the same way, there is a historical singularity of, of, you know, of the dinosaur, which you could argue. And I can't say much about the historical singularity of the dinosaur, first of all, because I don't know enough about them, second, uh, part, uh, because nobody else knows enough about them, and it would be projecting too much human thinking onto the dinosaur. But I can say something about the human limitations and about that kind of historical moment of having to respond. And also the tools, you know, all the different animals use tools as well in the kind of different ways, but the way we've developed tools. And some philosophers argue that like a, a flint that, you know, primitive man used to, to make fire or make something or use it as a tool, as a hammer, and then the pen or keyboard you use, and then language, so they're all on the spectrum. And artists are often scared of language. I think, oh, I have to write and I have to sing. My medium is different. But if you think of them as a spectrum of tools, flintstone and language, then they become, kind of, they become ways of doing something. And that is, for me, is that responsibility. And object-oriented, the reason, I will, I will not have another rant now, although, because it would require, do people know object-oriented philosophy? Have you been reading, yes, no? OK. So see, I've already told them they're going to die. I don't want to, to kill another kitten tonight. So, you know. But the problem is with ontology building and the notion of an object which is posited by the human. So it doesn't, for example, an object, whatever that be, is already pre-carved by a human with his or her visuality. And then it's passed off to his own. For example, if you look, I'm working on theories of perception now and trying to see what I'm calling non-human perception while recognizing the paradox of me looking at non-human perception and not being able to unsee it on my own vision. Well, I don't think they have that foundational moment. Once they foundational moment, you forget about it, then the whole thing makes sense. But the carving of the boundaries between objects, which would happen very different if the different organisms were involved in making uh, cuts between organisms. A photography, why I'm interested in, because it offers me the theory of the cut, so it allows me to reflect on practices of cutting materially and conceptually into duration of light. And it's a practice in which that moment of temporary stabilization of things becomes interesting. And something becomes a temporary object. I can hold it and then move on. So. Right, just, uh, are there any questions? Just, just wanna, I, have, I have a couple more, but I just want to make sure. OK, mm -hmm. I see a couple. Let me just ask this one, and then I'll, I'll open it up. Um, uh, I'll take the point around the cut. Um, as a way of um, bringing attention to or displaying the process or something like this. Um, but with photography, it's such a sort of resolutely visual medium. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, uh, in terms of your interest in machine perception, mm -hmm. um, what, what, does, what does the visual do in relationship to this expanded notion of responsibility? Um, but also with photography, maybe I'll answer it slightly differently, because I'm sure it does different things, but it re returns for me here to this kind of human affective attachment to certain forms of practice that the human, in this case me, likes. I just have always had a real love for photography as a medium. I don't have a big philosophical position for why I like photography. And I think in a way it would be bad if I had this position, because it would be very naff. I'll start theorizing, oh, I like photography because it's so special. I just really always liked it as a medium. It does something interesting for me. But I really think it's almost like, you know, the same way I kind of like chicken wings. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's no, the same, questions, quick, quick. The same <laughs> kind of affective attachment to a medium, to something that is uh, that perhaps you know theorizing it, which is not. It's not that it can't be theorized. Do you theorize chicken wings? <laughs> no, but that's it. I just enjoy them. So it's okay. the same with photography. I think you could make the same argument through different artistic practices, through different media. 
But for me, that it's just the, the practice that has drawn me in. I'm not keeping it like, oh, sacred, I won't theorize it. I just think if I start theorizing, I'll be pronouncing banalities to justify my aesthetic and affective preferences. So I'll just think, well, it's just an affective preference. All right, so I so saw one question here and another one there. So I, I'll, I'll repeat the question for people who can't hear it back. Yeah, I'll try to speak to that. <coughs> um, yeah, like my problem with the Anthropocene and, and well, and ethics and responsibility, um, it maybe is about definitions. And I don't know why it, I'm gonna, it's going to sound a bit like uh, being in the side of the devil now, I'm going to say. But um, since if, I, if I, I agree with this of decentralization or whatever, and that the human uh, species as not being anything so special, why is that there is this ethics and this big responsibility that we need to take to mm -hmm. save anything? Or I mean, it's like, is there a, of any other species is doing this? No, it's not that there is a necessarily a responsibility to save anything. Jen, can I, can I just make sure, did people hear the question yeah. at the back? Okay, yeah. so the question was, um, uh, if we get rid of human exceptionalism, uh, why carry on with ethics, which is kind of still a human thing? And because nothing else is trying to save the planet. Or yeah, it, it, it would be something very special that humans okay. do compared to. Yeah, but it's the same. The same with art. I think we need to distinguish, and maybe I didn't make it clear enough. We need to distinguish between human exceptionalism and historic, you know, historically specific human singularity. And it's the second one. I still am not prepared to abandon. The same with why do art, why do education in a formal context where people are pushed into red chairs and facing a lecturer for two hours. So the, for the same, very same reason, that certain historical practices have become meaningful to us humans. However, it's also, I don't think we should you know, have a responsibility to, to save something. I never said that. I think we have a responsibility. But to do what? We don't know. We have to figure it out. And why? Well, because we can. Because we've also already learned to pose questions, what it means to live. What does it mean to live a good life? How does it? Maybe it's to save, maybe it's actually not to save. Maybe it's to let die. You know, the debate about, you know, around euthanasia are showing that it's not such a simple question. It's not such a simple question in any case. But the ability, the historical ability that the species of ours has developed of posing these questions, being, it's already of being presented, with pushed, is what I mean by the touch of responsibility. Being able to do that is kind of pushing us to do it. But what I'm trying to do with this ethics as well, to put it as a task, as a way of figuring out, without yet saying, well, we have to go and save. Maybe we have to not go and save. Maybe that would be a good answer and good responsibility. And we have to do it because of the certain, uh, well, it's not we have to do it, because we've already invested certain sets of values and ideas in this. And obviously, I'm already positing a number of small V values here, which is one is that an examined life is worth living, is not worth living, which I'm taking from Socrates, but turning that life or expanding it beyond just like life of the soul towards the kind of material biological life as well. So it's a historically specific responsibility responding to our conditions, skill sets, uh, cognitive affective apparatus that's pushing us to do it. So the same way I do believe that it's worth producing art, although not all art is worth producing, but I wouldn't like to pass a degree in advance that this art shall not be made, although attempts like this have been made. The same with critical thinking, ethics for me, as a form of reflection on values rather than commandments, because presumably you could tell from my commandments, it doesn't really tell you what to do, where to go. <coughs> so you're not that helpful, though I enjoyed writing them. But they are ways of, of you know, pushing, addressing some kind of push I felt while also without foreclosing the discussion too early, if that makes sense. OK, there's a question. <coughs> yeah, um, I, I found it interesting when you speak out against, against like ontogeology, right? Mm -hmm. So getting stuck in this trap of an ontogeology. Mm -hmm. But um, if you like, I think you can generalize an ontology to be something that it's like a generalization of a set of philosophical concepts sure. about the world. Mm -hmm. but when you speak about ethics, is it possible that you're also falling into the trap of ethics becoming an ontology? Because no. like ethics is still underpinned by like something that's the good, for example, or, the, mm -hmm. or that's better. But mm -hmm. something yes. that's that's good is still, you know, based on a generalization of, you know, mm -hmm. life. Yeah. 
Yes, except sorry. no. Can I just, ask, can I just repeat it? For yeah, okay, that, sorry, okay. yes. Sorry, I know you wanted to okay. kind of, uh, jump in and tell him that as well. Um, the, so the question was, um, Jahan is kind of replacing uh, ontology with ethics, uh, because ontology is system building, kind of closing down, and so on and so forth. But ethics is still kind of a fun, in Johanna's version, becomes a kind of fundamental worldview or fundamental position, and to that extent, kind of reconstructs the very mm -hmm. thing that's we're trying to get away from with ontology. I mean, also, I'm very sympathetic to your question. I think it's a question that is necessary to be. I think it has to be asked and has to be asked constantly of philosophers, artists, thinkers of all kinds. At the same time, I think the, the, there are a lot of ethical positions which are founded upon ontology. However, the, what I'm trying to do is here, and it's also a certain thought experiment, if you like, although I'm not the only one performing it, this whole kind of tradition, it's precisely to position ethics as primary, one that wouldn't be based upon any predefined notion of the good, notion of, uh, of value. So even though there are some forms of your words, I mean, words themselves are kind of used to, to describe this or to articulate this, there's also a moment of hesitation which is inserted. The, the impossibility or the unwillingness to decide in advance of what it is. So there is a certain philosophical flipping happening here in the sense that, I mean, obviously, in some minimal way, we're all building ontologies. I mean, I construct a model of the London Tube every morning when I try to get to work, and I still assume the London Bridge will be where it was yesterday, and it would be very upsetting if today I was going home and it wasn't there. So in some, this, it requires a certain ontology on my part, or also you know, epistemological commitment, while also a model in my head, which is a model I've received from others, with pragmatic reasons, I buy it. I think, yeah, this is where the line will go. But the broader philosophical sense, I think, in a broader way how, and also ontologies. I mean, I've built a whole kind of diorama and made a universe, made a universe and I was looking like a god upon it. And also I was playing with that. But we all make worlds all the time. You create universes as artists. They are more big, they are small, they are medium sized, but we are doing this. It's just a certain recognition of the gesture of building worlds. That's why I don't have so many problems with Deleuze and Guattari and their ontological undertakings, because I think they are aware of the kind of very gesture of building the world. Although, you know, there's terrible things have been committed in the name of Deleuze and Guattari when people took them as kind of, well, this is now the world what it's like, and this is what it's constructed, and this is how we're now describing it. So it's forms of articulation that concern me more. And ethics, again, becomes, a, if you like, and this form of non-foundational ethics, which to many philosophers would be seen as like impossibilities. Either you're doing ethics or you're doing, you know, and foundational or nothing. But this way, in playing with the paradox as well, becomes a way of loosening up some of these. So, of course, ontologies, strategically, yes, but as a kind of unacknowledged ones, worrying, potentially dangerous. So we can see two more questions, but I'm going to do a mansplanation version of what you just okay. said. Um, which is, so is it something like your, your notion of ethics as response, <coughs> and therefore responsibility, um, means that there isn't a kind of, uh, as you said, like a, a prescribed structure of values. And in a way, the values are created and generated through the response. Uh, which means that it's always situated, contingent. And in a way, this seems much closer to uh, notions of artistic practice rather than philosophical system building. Yeah, so the absolutely. philosophical system building, you have to have absolutely. like the total picture. Yeah, absolutely. Right. absolutely. And also, this returns me to photography and this notion of the cut. And you can, you know, you cut not just as photographers, you cut when you, you know, work with fabrics, when you, when you work in Final Cut Pro, when you, you cut in lots of ways, but also when you show all your work in crits and they tell you to cut it or to change it, you have to adjust it. So that practice of cutting, which you know so well on so many different levels, also becomes a way of, of temporarily stabilizing. And that notion of temporary stabilization of things is important to me. That's why um, it becomes a moment, because obviously, we're talking about ethics, how values emerge in all of this, but there is never just emergence. Otherwise, I would never be able to use any of these words I'm using and I'm assuming you understand. You would never be able to bring your work to a crit and at least hope for some kind of understanding from your fellow students, from your tutors. There is assumptions that things temporarily stabilize. So I tell you, you know, 
uh, come to this room at Goldsmiths at 6 p.m. So you all know um, uh, decide what you know what 6 or 5 p.m. means, and you'll be here on time. So those temporary stabilizations, pragmatic, but also kind of ways of stilling time, if you like. They, they happen in lots of different ways. But for me, photography, again, becomes a good way of visualizing that process. But we do those temporary stabilizations uh, all the time. And I think in that ethical discussion, the recognition of the moments of temporary stabilization is important. They can become words, concepts, values. It's just if we remember that they are temporary stabilizations, we can always de-temporalize them. We can always make them fluid, put them back into, back into the pot and stabilize another thing temporarily. OK, there's a question here. Another one. Yeah, uh, I was uh, trying to understand more of like the practical daily um, kind of like perspective that you give. Because mm -hmm. you, you, like, you use the words modes of, uh, of becoming in your final words, mm -hmm. like in your final thoughts. And I was trying to understand like how this will not be or relate to the, the fear. And the words what I feel, mm -hmm. and and also I, I was trying to relate the thinking as the most political form of activity within the Anthropocene to this daily practice that we would like be then able to <coughs> pursue or like to change mm -hmm. perspectives while living and producing mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. because in a sense we will be always producing, mm -hmm. like no matter what, mm -hmm. no matter if like sure. producing or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that thinking is perhaps the most responsible, uh, uh, most responsible thing we can do, with the emphasis on perhaps. So it was almost like a philosophical joke. Maybe other things are equally good, if you like, with this good understanding it's a temporary stabilization here. But it was also, it was a certain call more towards the invisibility of practice through which something can change. Thinking could be one of them, you know, enacting something else. And again, it doesn't have to be even organized thinking. But to return to kind of Deleuze and Guattari and that notion of, uh, of, of becoming, I mean, obviously, this project is in conversation with practices or, and philosophies of becoming and philosophies of process. But for me, Deleuze and Guattari, through the whole of their work, don't make enough um, of the notion of the cut which they themselves use. In cinema books, the coupage is so important, and yet it kind of almost stays there. And then there, maybe it's also not the matter of them, because I, I, I take the cut as well, partly from Deleuze and Guattari, but uh, what happens in their readings, especially in the Anglo-American context, that is still this focus on the flow of life and this constant becoming. Well, I'm interested in photography and life, in, when things fra get fractured, when things stabilize, when things get cut in size to a certain measure. So that moment of the cut, which is extended beyond the cinematic practice, the photographic practice, and becomes a way of, of articulating something, of creating something temporarily. <coughs> so, and also the violence of the cut, because some cuts are violent, they're not always just, as it, and, and they're necessary, is something that interests me. So yes, it is very kind of, uh, uh, kind of Deleuzean, I suppose, but in a, in this kind of darker way. Uh, just for the next question, just for the reference, if you want to, I think the stuff from Deleuze Guattari in the cut was the cinema's book? Yes, cinema's book. Cinema um, one and two. And cinema. also it's in Anti Oedipus, right? Anti Oedipus, yes. Yeah. I think the early chapters of Anti Oedipus. Mm -hmm. um, this question here. By, uh, sorry, how do we hang on to idealism if we get rid of the notion of human exceptionalism? That was the question. Uh, what do you mean by idealism? Well, like uh, what Matsu would call the correlation of circle. So mm -hmm. Because I think the 
there are absolutely no scientific or philosophical reasons to hold on to this. I mean, I don't believe in dragons either, although I find them cute. So almost for the same reason. And if the answer sounds flippant, it isn't. It's actually very serious. It's exactly for the same reason. It's not a helpful device. I think it can be. And a lot of damage has been done in the name of hanging on to human exceptionalism, especially throughout human history. Most humans have been excluded at one time or another from this category, you know. Women, Jews, I mean, just like, give another moment of history. Now, you know, it's just times change, but the different groups of people emerge. And you know, now asylum seekers and uh, refugees, and even though verbally we recognize, but on the practice of actual lived realities, we don't. So there is that the kind of dodgy category as it is. But how do we actually decide that we want to do something? So idealism i would kind of get rid of it as this big framework because of the you know the term has a certain historical legacy i'm not so happy with and how ideas you know how they are shaped but temporarily defined ideas that this historically shaped human creates are obviously important as you say believing in the value of education or art is some form of idealism in that in that kind of anchored sense and we do i do kind of I acknowledge the, the need for recognizing those kind of uh, human practices, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to pre-decide them and decide in advance, we've got all of these and these are practices. But as groups of humans, in particular kind of social setups, we do obviously agree, but also think we need to question, because if we hadn't questioned it, you know, forms of art we would still be producing would be very different from probably what the majority of you are gonna do for your MFA. So even though we might agree and historically agree for centuries that art is important, what counts as art has undergone a re radical redefinition in the last few years. So there was still a certain desire to, and maybe that kind of itch, so uh, exercising the human ability to respond while also not taking stuff for granted. Um, I've, got, I've got a follow-up to that. Um, I know you, you've already asked. Can I just see if there's any more? There's one at the back. Can I just, I'll just do the follow-up to this and then I'll come to you. Um, so in terms of the, the things that are excluded from recognition mm -hmm. uh, and for which responsibility needs to happen, I was interested in your work in machine vision, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you were saying earlier before we started, you're kind of beginning to, to work on that. And um, the, the machine vision question is partly, again, to do with uh, why photography, why visuality, mm -hmm. forms, of, forms of practice. But it's also, uh, I'm asking it in the context of the Anthropocene, because one of the issues about the Anthropocene, like, we, like the images that you showed of like skeletons and deserts and this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, are sort of experiential perceptions of what, what it might amount to. Mm -hmm. But in a way, that's also just a desert, yes, right? Yes. Uh, we understand the Anthropocene as a global or planetary um, demand mm -hmm. because of, essentially because of computer modeling. Mm -hmm. And so the way that we understand what's happening across the planet is through something that we can't actually see perceptually, mm -hmm. but it's given to us through modeling mechanisms mm -hmm. and through sort of machine vision. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering about the uh, interest for you in machine vision given, uh, kind of as an ethical yes, issue, yeah. I guess. Yeah, so I'm kind of trying to, with this notion of non-human vision, I'm trying on the one hand look at uh, precisely what, what you talked about, these expanded forms of perception and vision that transcend the human visual apparatus. For example, you know, the fact that, you know, how you can see the remote galaxies, and usually when we see them, they don't exist anymore. <coughs> They've exploded and they arrive as always kind of late. And what it means to be able to see this form of modeling, this form of translation of space imagery into data, so which then calories are scrapped. So all these things are of interest to me, but then I kind of reverse back. And obviously Google can see, you know, even that, the way Google sees, you can't ever see all of this. And uh, you know, if you traverse, you can't traverse every street in the, in the kind of recognizable world. But there is that notion then of human, that humans themselves see in ways that are kind of perhaps also uh, not just human, in the sense that they've always uh, rel relied on kind of forms of processes to their own vision, perception. And I'm looking at what's called these ecological series of visions, looking at people like uh, James Gibson and Peter Flosser and, uh, and Tim Ingold, the anthropologist. When you're thinking about perception, maybe it doesn't just happen with the eye, but with the body and uh, how the body itself, the apparatus, is involved in it. So moving beyond or outside perspective, 
means there is very much, and again, I probably don't need to explain this to this crowd, because you're already presumably well versed in both seeing and unseeing things, but perspectival mo mode of seeing things is obviously historically specific, and yet it's presented as natural, right? It's things like a smaller when they are farther away, they are, you look at medieval pictures and they're supposed to look weird, and then the everything after medieval paintings and photographs are supposed to look more real. This interesting artist called Richard, um, Wit, sorry, I forgot his son. We've got him in photo mediations machine. Uh, he works on photographs and films from which he removes perspective, and he writes very beautifully about it. And I find that very interesting. So in a way, I'm trying to find those moments of non-human vision, not just in satellites and Google, even though I start from them, but also to look for them in the human, seeing what would it mean for the human to recognize that he, she is also a part of the operator, the machine, if you like, rather than machines. You know, machines are us kind of project. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I think, well, of course, I've heard of Simondon, and, uh, uh, and I don't use that much Simondon in my own work, but there are affinities between his way of thinking and notion of individuation, which could be another term for what I call in my work temporary stabilization, which is that kind of form. So, yes, absolutely, it's a spot on comment. Uh, there's a new translation of Simondon's major book coming out mm -hmm. in, I think, April next year. So, um, there's one more question from you. Yes, you. Um, yeah, so this is just kind of following up on what you said earlier. So if humans are not exceptional, then is there even like a necessity for human life? No. But, you know. Okay, the question, the question <laughs> was, <laughs> let's, just, let's go this again, let's quickly rewind this. Um, the question was, if humans aren't exceptional, is there any necessity for human life? But the, the fact that there is no necessity, it's a by the by. The life is kind of them. I mean, for example, I quite like living, actually. And it doesn't mean it, you know, that it doesn't come with a lot of anger and pain and general sense of dissatisfaction or slightly being at odds with it. And you wouldn't end up being a philosopher or an artist if you just kind of embraced life as it comes. But in that sense, it's, it's almost by the by the question. I don't need a bigger justification of life to kind of find certain moments of doing something, intervening, like meaningful in that particular moment. So in the sense, and I think Stanislav Lem's Summa Technologia is a, it's a book from 1964. It's a very interesting book. And it really debunks that kind of uh, human exceptionalism. And yet Lem is very humanist in a way that I think I'm kind of not. I wrote an introduction to that book and tried to sketch this out. But I really recommend Lem's Summa Technologia say 1964, and he predicted so many things, including like the internet and uh, search engines, and talking about evolution as biological and technological phenomena is intertwined. That was interesting. There's a question over there. Sorry, just, just to repeat. So the question was um, whether what Johanna was talking about, uh, how it relates to artificial intelligence, and in particular to Asimov's three laws of robotics, which are sort of human-centered about not harming humans, mm -hmm. self-destruction if there's an attempt to harm humans, <coughs> and, so, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, that, I find, I mean, Asimov is very interesting in whole, you know, ways of formulating certain problems, expanding the certain notion of. Um, of ethics. At the same time, there is something, as you yourself said, quite humanist in that notion, so in the sense that it takes a very humanist value-based model about what's good and what's not and expands it to other classes of beings. And it says, well, it's the same thing that a lot of bioethicists now do around kind of dolphins and chimpanzees. So for example, um, uh, 
who is that Peter Singer says that anencephalic babies, so babies born without a brain, could be terminated like immediately, even though they smile when they are born, and parents think, well, my baby is just, this is, but they have no brain, they just should go. But he says, but chimpanzees and dolphins should be treated like children with play, or babies with brains, because they are, cognitive processes are uh, very developed. So they, and so, in a way, it's, I, lots of people think that Singer is shocking, because he like, turns everything upside down. I think he's not radical enough. In the sense, he still takes the model of the human who is special, who has values, and then he tries to say, okay, does this category belong here? No. So this one is out, but another one comes in. But the model stays unquestioned. Well, what I'm more interested in, and that's why Professor Hale said that I'm more interested in this non-systemic philosophy, or philosophy like built by artists. And obviously, as I say, I'm not the only one that people like, you know, you know Derrida, Sixou, Deleuze, uh, Deleuze, and others were doing that. And it was, their, it, was, it was their kind of concept for a long time. So trying to think, let me just dismantle the system or try to build a philosophy on very shaky foundations and seeing, seeing what happens. So as a, some kind of temp, you know, thought experiment at some point would be useful, but I wouldn't update them because I would like to kind of dismantle it from the, the notion of the human upon which that very notion of the rights and, and obligations of robots is premised. Okay, la last question. I kind of feel like we should be ethical and sort of, you know, stop making, stop you working quite so much. But I'll take one last question. So, so the question is, um, given the framework that Johan is proposing, what's the relationship? Uh, what's the ethical relationship between humans specifically, and what's the what's the view on the history of ethics, which are mainly human centered? Yeah, um, I suppose it's. I'm trying to avoid this, and maybe sometimes in talks it's difficult to avoid this. I'm trying to avoid saying like, oh, all the ethics before me stupid. Now I'm doing something really clever. So it's definitely not that. It's much more recognizing that ethics has historically been premised on certain sets of values and deciding you know, how these values are, you know, and what is good, what is bad, basically. And it's only in kind of um, later times ethics has become almost like a second level reflection on the constitution, although you can trace the trends of that reflection going back to the very early ethicists that the moment of the formulation of those values is there. So for me, it's important, but I'm not a historian of ethics. Of course, in the publications, especially in the bioethics book, I've done quite a bit of work looking at specific constitution of values in different ethical traditions. So I think it's important, of course, to recognize it's the same as artists should know art history if they want to go and break things and know you in breaking. The same way, if you're writing about ethics, you should go and you know you should go and know the history of philosophy, the history of ethics. If you want to dismantle the system, I mean, you need to know what you're dismantling. Otherwise, you know, you'd just be like you know, a kid throwing kind of prams, uh, just toys out of the pram. So that's that's the kind of important bit, the the direct recognition of that. And I forgot the second part of your question. So. Oh, the ethics between humans. So in a way, it's a kind of, uh, it becomes that form of obligation. We don't yet know who it comes from. It come from a, might come from a human, might come from an animal, <coughs> might come from an ecosphere, and uh, whether there is such a thing as an ecosphere or atmosphere. And it's a way of kind of figuring out. So again, there is not something more privileged or special about that relationship. At the same time, we might figure out in that process of politics, not just ethics, politics very often determines, declares how we should treat other humans. And I think a lot of things we call ethics are actually political decisions. I absolutely believe that politics is necessary for us to, well, for example, to decide how we're going to deal with the asylum crisis. You need policy work for it. You need to decide what do you do with other, with other humans, you know, who are pressing their bodies against certain fronts. What, how do you respond to that? It's a political discussion. It has to happen. Ethics has to precede that in a way. But sometimes there is no time for ethical discussions because we are just pressed to make quick decisions around policy and politics. Uh, okay, could you, could you just, just as a final statement, you, you mentioned Levinas a few times. Mm -hmm. Could you give a reference for people who might want to follow? Uh, the, uh, Levinas, um, 
the book just, well, there's an essay, a short essay called Ethics as a First Philosophy. Short essay, very understandable, Ethics as First Philosophy. I also have a book which kind of introduces Levinas to non-philosophers. It's called The Ethics of Cultural Studies. So even if you're not interested in cultural studies, but it's basically to think how you can take ethical thinking to culture. Our library's got multiple copies. So Levinas, uh, Ethics as First Philosophy, and the book, The Ethics of Cultural Studies, which kind of outlines some of this. That's great. Okay, thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you.